Welcome to the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture Fruit Research Station in Clarksville, Arkansas. My name is Jackie Lee and I'm the director here. Our station is primarily known for our fruit breeding program, but we also support many other research endeavors, including development of better production practices, exploring IPM tactics, and exploring new specialty crops that could have a fit in Arkansas. I'm excited to introduce this research project today, focusing on the feasibility of hops production in Arkansas. You will get to see some of the research on hops our researchers and graduate students are conducting, which will help determine if hops may be a good option for growers to consider adding to their fields. And you will get the chance to learn the basics of how hops are grown here in Arkansas. I want to hand it over to the lead scientist on this project, Drs. Amanda McWirt and Renee Frelfall and Aaron Cato. They will tell you a little bit more about this project. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Amanda McWirt. I serve as the Fruit and Vegetable Production Extension Specialist for the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. I direct the production and cultural practices of this project and co-lead this project on hops production in Arkansas with Dr. Renee Threlfall. Hi everyone, I'm a research scientist in the Department of Food Science at the University of Arkansas and I lead the hops quality analysis aspect of this project. And we are also joined by our project collaborator, Dr. Aaron Cato. Hi everyone, my name is Aaron Cato and I serve as the Commercial Fruit and Vegetable Integrated Pest Management Extension Specialist for the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. I lead the, pro the pest management portion of this project. We're excited to have you here today to join us as we tour our hops research at the University of Arkansas Fruit Research Station. Today we are going to walk through our hop yard and give you some information about what we have learned as far as how to produce and harvest hops successfully here in Arkansas. You will get to meet several members of our research team, some of the growers and brewers our project is working with, and get to see how hops grow, how we manage them for diseases and insects, and how we harvest them for use in local products. Our hop project began when we planted our first hops plants in the fall of 2018, and our project is supported by a grant from the Arkansas Department of Agriculture Specialty Crop Block Program. The goal of our project is to evaluate the viability of producing hops in Arkansas and to evaluate the quality of the hops that can be produced. Our hope is that we are able to determine which cultivars that will do well in Arkansas and that we can supply our local breweries with a locally grown product. Mm -hmm. As a part of this webinar and virtual tour, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the program. So as you have questions, please enter them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to as many of them as possible at the end of the program. First up, we're going to talk about how hops grow through a season, how to manage the plants, and how to select cultivars. Let's get started. First, let's watch how hops plants grow through a single season. Hops are a crown-forming plant, and during the winter, the crown lies dormant under the soil. In the spring, new vines emerge and grow upwards in a clockwise pattern and are typically trained to strings on a trellis. Notice that these stems are called vines with a B. We typically cut back the earliest vines and train vines that emerge later in the spring. This selection of later emerging vines can help with disease management and crop timing. As the plants grow, the main vine will produce side stems called laterals. And on these laterals is where the hops plant will produce flowers, that later turn into the cones. It's important to realize that in hops plants, there can be both male and female flowers that are typically produced on separate male and female plants. Female plants produce the cones and so are the only ones grown in a typical commercial production setting. The hops cone contains lupulin and alpha and beta acids that impart the flavor and bittering qualities to beer. If male plants are allowed in the field, the cones will have seeds in them, which reduces hop cone quality. Hops flower once they reach a certain number of nodes and when they are, there are short days. Hops are primarily grown in the north where day lengths exceed 15 hours. Here in Arkansas, our longest days are 14.5 hours in midsummer. Our shorter days mean that the plants very likely flower as soon as they reach the correct number of nodes. This may limit our yields because plants flower before the plant has put on a lot of side lateral growth. So cutting back those early shoots may help force the crop to be slightly later and may improve yields and hop cone quality. However, we're still trying to determine optimum 
cutting back or pruning dates for Arkansas. Female flowers develop into cones over a period of several weeks, but are not immediately ready for harvest. Or we will discuss how to determine when a hop cone is ready for harvest a little later on. Cones can be individually hand harvested on young plants or the binds can be cut to the ground and all the binds removed in a single harvest. After harvest is over in the fall, the binds are cut back to the ground and the plant returns to the dormant state as winter approaches. We are evaluating seven publicly available hops cultivars in our trial. Some popular hops cultivars like Mosaic, Citra, and Simcoe are not publicly available and come out of private breeding programs that require a contract with the company in order to acquire plants and be grown. This limits what growers are able to produce these cultivars. These contracts would likely be difficult for an Arkansas grower to secure, and so we are only looking at cultivars that are publicly available and can be purchased by anyone. Here are the seven cultivars we're looking at. We have Cascade, Nugget, Zeus, Cashmere, Crystal, Centennial, and Canadian Red Vine. Let's walk through the field a little bit and talk about the characteristics of each of these. Again, these plants are mostly all planted in the mid-fall of 2018 using plug plants. This is our second harvest season. We actually got a small harvest last year uh, in 2019 um, on the first summer after planting some of these plants. All right, so the first one we're gonna talk about is Cascade, and this is probably one of the most widely grown cultivars of hops uh, that's produced here in the U.S. This cultivar was developed even here in the United States by the USDA Hop Breeding Program and was released as an aroma variety, but has been used as a dual purpose hop. Uh, as you can see here, it's very productive and early for us. Um, the plants have been healthy and we saw flowering in late June after the plants were cut back in early May. It is showing some nice large hop cones. Uh, lateral branches are more compact than some of the other cultivars, which you'll kind of see here. So this is one of the lateral branches and you can kind of see that it's, it's staying closer to that main vine. Uh, some of the other cultivars have a lot, uh, a lot longer and, and more significant number of them. One thing we are noticing is, is that this cultivar has cones that are ready for harvest and still has some flowers on it. And this could make me mechanized or single pass harvest uh, a little bit more difficult because of the differences in hop cone maturity. We did get a small harvest off of this cultivar in the first year of planting, uh, and we're excited to see how this is gonna perform in terms of quality and yield here in Arkansas. What we're gonna talk about is Nugget, and this has shown pretty poor vigor and plant health and really poor cone set overall. Um, in 2018, when we first planted these plants, we saw really poor survival on the plants going into the first season of 2019, and we replanted a lot of those during 2019, and so a lot of these plants are really only a year old. But this year, the performance has really not improved. Uh, Nugget was originally intended for use as a bittering hop and was also released by the USDA. We're seeing really poor lateral branches, and this is not one we would currently recommend for planting in Arkansas on a commercial scale. You can see that typically we are training three binds per plant, but on this plant we were only able to get two successfully, and we're not really seeing very much cone set uh, yet, if any cone set will happen at all on this cultivar. All right, next up is Zeus. Uh, and Zeus is sometimes also called CTZ or Columbus Tomahawk or Zeus. Um, and it goes by several of these names, but basically it refers to all of the same variety. Um, this is another one that is also very widely planted in the United States, again, making up anywhere from you know, 10 to 11% of hop acreage across the United States. Uh, if you look at Zeus now, um, it's growing very vigorously, but we saw from the, the early season that it was kind of slow to get started. Uh, last year, this cultivar was our biggest producer, and that was on plants that were only nine months old. And this year is still putting on quite a show. Um, we're seeing very vigorous uh, lateral arm branches. Uh, and in fact, we may need to actually have this planted on a slightly wider plant spacing than what we've given it here. Um, all of our cultivars are planted on two and a half feet due to the space we have available, but this one might do better at about three and a half feet. Again, it was slow to get started after the um, we pruned it back in the spring, but now appears to be the cultivar that will be ready for harvest first. Uh, and we are seeing better uniformity of hop cone maturity on this cultivar over Cascade right now, uh, and a really nice setting of, of hops cones on Zeus. All right, next one we're going to talk about is Cashmere. And this is a dual purpose hop resulting from a cross between Cascade and Northern Brewer. It's supposed to have higher alpha acids than Cascade and kind of a tropical citrus aroma. Uh, 
This one looked a little poor early on in the season, but it has recovered and now has some nice cones set. Um, it does kind of appear that the cones are a little bit smaller than some of the other cultivars that we've looked at. Um, and this one did have poor survival on the first year and we replanted. So some of these plants are only one year old, which may be impacting some of the results that we were seeing and explain why these plants are a little bit smaller overall. We are still uh, continuing to evaluate this one. Uh, we are excited about the potential of this one just because of the hop cone quality and its potential use in brewing. All right, next up is Crystal. And Crystal is described as being a hop that is mild and with a spicy aroma. Uh, early on in the season, this was a very vigorous grower. Um, but as of now, it's, it's not quite as, as vigorous as some of the other ones that we see out here like Zeus. Um, but it has some cone set. Um, but maybe some weaker bind vigor overall. Um, and if you zoom in here, I do want to point out something. You know, this is again another one where we're seeing, you know, some flowers still being set, and then higher up, we're seeing cones being set. So we're still evaluating this one. We did get a small harvest off of this cultivar in the first year after planting. All right, now we're going to look at Centennial. Centennial is a dual purpose hop, sometimes called Super Cascade for its similar characteristics to Cascade. It was named for the centennial anniversary of Washington State uh, and again was developed by the USDA program. Early on in the season, this was a very vigorous grower. Um, we've seen some inconsistencies across our different plots and how this one is performing. And so we're gonna kind of keep an eye on it. Um, in some places, it does look pretty good. Uh, in the first year, it did struggle to grow well in the early spring, much like Nugget, but it's doing a lot better uh, this year. Um, as we move up and look at the plant, you will see that, you know, there is some nice cone size, um, but the number of cones that are being set is not as impressive as some of the other cultivars we've already looked at. And then finally, we're going to look at Canadian red vine. And this is a new cultivar for us this year, and is maybe one that you've never heard of, but it has shown promise in some other parts of the southeast, and so we wanted to try it here in Arkansas. Um, just to give you a heads up, because this is new, these plants were only planted in May of this year. Um, and so they're relatively young, um, but we are getting some good growth, growth on, off of them in this first year. Uh, Canadian red vine did start setting laterals and blooms in early July. And if you look closely, you can still see that there are still blooms um, here on the plants and that we haven't gotten to cone set yet on this variety. And that's probably partially because of the late planting date. Uh, this one is interesting also because of the hop cone quality. So it's known to have low alpha acids of about 5% or less, but to have very high cohumulone of about 47%, which is sometimes thought to impart kind of a harsh or bitter flavor. Um, however, it can be used with other hops when brewing to kind of balance out some of that. Um, it's described as having an aroma that's a mild berry or cherry flavor or some grapefruit peel aroma. So we're interested in this cultivar because it is said to be very vigorous and disease resistant, which are qualities that are going to be important for us in our hot and humid environment. Some concern is, is that the plant um, can be a little too bush-like and doesn't grow as upright as some of the other hops cultivars. We're not really seeing that here, um, but we'll see if that, that plays out later on um, in, in future seasons. For all of these cultivars, we're going to be collecting data on wet and dry hop cone yields per plant and running analysis on the alpha and beta acids and quality of the dried cones for brewing. These results are going to be reported on later this year, so keep an eye out for that information on our blog. Remember, you can enter your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen throughout this webinar, and we'll try and get to as many of them at the end as we can. Now let's go talk about some of the cultural practices like pruning and trellising that we use to grow hops. Let's start off with a discussion on pruning. Hops pruning is simple and easy. It begins in the late spring to facilitate the selection of binds that will be trained up the strings and continues throughout the summer to keep the base of the plants clean. In the spring, the first binds that emerge are often cut back to the ground to select binds that are later and less likely to be infected with disease. Pruning in the spring is relatively simple. Using a pair of clippers, cut all emerged binds to the ground. Be sure to remove all cut binds from the field. Where spring hops pruning gets a bit tricky is in the timing. Hops require long days to induce flower and cone production and should have an optimal amount of plant growth before they start to flower. Pruning too early or too late could reduce yields. Because there is still a lot we're learning about hops production in, in Arkansas, the best time to prune is still being determined. 
As part of this research trial, we are looking at effects of different pruning timings. One third of this section of cascade plants was pruned on April 15th, one third on May, thir on May 1st, and the final third on May 15th. Early re yield results on these cascade plants indicate pruning later, around May 1st to May 15th, has the best results. It is likely, different, it is likely that different cultivars will need different pruning dates. The second type of pruning begins after the spring cutdown, when selected vines have begun to regrow and will continue throughout the season. When these regrown vines reach four to six feet high, remove the lower leaves and laterals from the bottom 12 to 18 inches of the vines. This allows for better air circulation in the hops yard and can also aid in the prevention of foliar disease. Next, we'll look at trellising and training the vines. At this time, I'm not going to talk about site selection and preparation, but check out our fact sheet for more information on these topics. I will mention that it is important to have the trellis built and the irrigation installed before planting the hops plants. Hops grow rapidly in the summer, growing as much as 12 inches per day. Vines easily reach 18 to 20 feet tall each season. Trellising helps keep the vines off the ground, improves airflow, and it makes management and harvest easier. There are several different types of trellising systems out there, and we won't go into specifics today on all the styles that are available, but we'll briefly show you the two types we are trying out at the research station. In our main system, we modified an old grape trellis, extending it to 12 feet and adding extra braces and anchors to ensure stability in the wind. Typically, hops are grown on 18-foot tall trellises, but we were interested in seeing if, gro if grape growers could modify a row or two to grow hops. We are also evaluating an ibex trellis developed by trellis growing systems that can be rotated down to avoid the use of ladders. This trellis is also 12 feet tall. In these plots, we are also trying to grow in black landscape fabric for weed control. Next, we will talk about training the vines. Many of these base pr basic principles we will cover regarding training are true regardless of the trellis height or design. While there are trellising lines and anchors designed specifically for hops, we adapted items we already had on hand. Now, like I mentioned earlier, our hops trellis is 12 feet high, so we cut the trellis training lines in 13 foot lengths. We have tried a couple kinds of material for lines, but so far, baling twine has worked the best for us. Hops production guides recommend using one to three trellis lines per plant. The number of lines you use will depend on the cultivar and vigor of your hops plants. We decided to use three trellis lines per plant. We may adjust this number in the future as we learn more about how different cultivars grow in our climate. All three lines were tried to a landscape staple, which was inserted at an angle near the crown of the hop plant. We insert the staples at an angle so when the lines are pulled tight, the staples don't pull out of the ground. Using a ladder, the lines are secured to the top trellising wire. Space the lines about six inches apart on the wire. The lines will become a bit slack as the season progresses, so be sure to pull them tight when initially securing them to the trellis wire. Installing the trellising lines can be done the day, the day you prune or shortly after. Hops grow quickly, so don't wait too long in getting the trellis lines up after spring pruning. Installing the line before pruning is possible, but will complicate and slow pruning. Vines will begin to re-emerge very quickly after pruning. As they do, select the three best binds and begin training them to the line. One bind per line. Train the binds clockwise around the twine. One of the best things about growing hops is once that you get the binds started on the lines, they will do the rest themselves. Hops have a shallow root system, making them very susceptible to drying out in the heat of an Arkansas summer. They also require a consistent supply of water during the, the growing season to support their rapid growth. But the plants cannot withstand flooding. Plants may need several gallons of water per day during the height of the summer. Drip irrigation is the best option for irrigating hops in order to maintain moisture in the shallow root zone and ensure foliage remains dry to reduce disease potential. One line of hard-sided tubing per row is common and rec recommendations suggest in-line emitters spaced at every two feet with an output of 0.42 gallons per hour. During the peak of the growth and heat, we irrigate three times a week for several hours. Finally, let's talk a little bit about fertilizing hops. As hops have not been grown extensively in Arkansas, the soil testing lab does not yet have a crop code for hops. This means getting fertilizer recommendations from a soil test would not be specific for hops. To compensate for this, we chose to follow standard fertilizing recommendations for hops production. 
for second year production and onwards, 100 to 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre is recommended. We split this recommended amount of nitrogen into four equal apps and used a balanced triple 13 fertilizer. The first application was applied on May 15th with the remaining three applications following every two weeks. We ended up fertilizer applications in mid-June to early July because research has shown that most of the fertilizer requirements occur in the early growing season. For small scale hops growers, one tablespoon of triple 15 sprinkled every, three, every two weeks around the base of the plant from early May to early July should be sufficient. Fertilizer can be applied through fertigation or by spreading a granular fertilizer. Because we are testing different rates as part of our trial, we applied fertilizer by hand. If applying by hand, be sure to spread it evenly to avoid burning roots. When possible, apply before rain or before irrigation to make the fertilizer available to the plant more quickly. Because our climate and soils are different than areas where hops are typically grown, we are looking at varying rates of fertilizer and the effects on hops cone yields and hops cone quality. We will report back in the next few years on our results. My name is Ronnie Ledford. I live in Burnville, Arkansas. Uh, I'm a military retiree. I have family in Western Arkansas, so I decided to come up here after I retired. I got a job with the state uh, and bought some property. I found this group in Wisconsin, and they were trying to reintroduce hops in the Midwest. And I thought, cool, I'll brew beer. I, that sounds like the plan. So I went to a seminar up in Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, I got hooked. I currently have about a half acre of hops. It's definite that we can grow Centennial and Cascade in Western Arkansas. That's a fact. I'm also having uh, a new success with a new variety called Cashmere. Um, Mom was a Cascade, Dad was a Northern Brewer. So it's, it's a little bit spicier than a normal Cascade, more fruitier. So it's, um, it's a really good hop. And then the fourth one will be Crystal. And I haven't had much success with Crystal yet, but I think I will. My number one advice would be to pre-plan everything. I mean, get it done before you put a hop in the ground. Have, have it all done. Have your, have your field laid out. Uh, have your soil tested. Everything you can do beforehand will save you a lot of heartache. Trust me. I'll save you a lot of heartache uh, down the road. If you can, if you can use Arkansas hops to brew an Arkansas beer, and put a hog on the can, people will buy it. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. I've, like I said, I've had nothing but nothing but success. Uh, I've had a very limited amount of product. Uh, in 2017, I had cashmere available, and I sent it over to uh, Liz Preston at Preston Rose Farm and she brewed something called Logan County Cashmere, I believe was the name of, of, of the beer. Extremely popular. I think it sold out that weekend mm -hmm. after she brewed it. And then in 2018, I sold Centennial and Cascade to um, the brewer, well, Oxbin Brewing in Ozark. So I walk in the door and say, I have Arkansas hops and I'm telling you, they are all over me. The potential is there. It's a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. There's a lot involved with growing hops. You just don't throw them in the ground and walk away. You got to talk to them. You got to be down there every day and work with them. Mm -hmm. But the payoff is should be absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It really should be. So yeah, if you want to get into it, we, you can grow hops in Arkansas. You can grow good hops in Arkansas. When my hops were tested, evaluated for their alpha content last year, it was in the range. Now granted, it was a little bit low, but it was still in, it was still in the range. So all that means is that if, if your recipe calls for you know two ounces of hops, you're gonna put in two and a half ounces of my hops. Mm -hmm. But you're gonna have used an Arkansas hop. It doesn't get any better than that. I'm here with James McClellan, a master's student working with Dr. Renee Threlfall on production, pest management, and post-harvest quality of hops in Arkansas. 
James and I are going to discuss a few things today about pest management hops grown here in Arkansas, and we hope to provide a framework for management that will help you succeed in producing hops within the state. Specifically, we will cover disease management and prevention, how and where to scout for insects, and we'll go into a bit more depth for the major pests that we've observed so far. Hops in Arkansas are at a high risk of disease development due to our hot and humid growing conditions throughout the summer. Downy mildew and powdery mildew are generally going to be our primary concern when we're thinking about Arkansas hop production. Last year we observed a lot of downy mildew at multiple locations, especially some of the grower locations, and it is clear that Arkansas growers need to focus on preventing this disease. That needs to be the main focus of your disease uh, management program. Downy mildew and other diseases should be managed through cultural practice such as early vine pruning and by using a fungicide prevention program with applications around 10 to 14 days depending on whether or not you had rainfall in that period. We currently use a rotation of Pristine and Aliette on 10 day intervals. Uh, we use 14 days the year, first year and still observe significant downy mildew issues likely because of a lot of the rain earlier in the year. This year we haven't observed many diseases related issues with the spray schedule although it is starting to crop up now which is potentially because of just the differences in environmental conditions. Organic growers should rely on sulfur in their management plans. Hops need to be scouted every week for insects, diseases, and any nutrient deficiencies. When scouting, it's a good idea to scan the yard for discolored plants, and this will generally give you a good idea if you have a large nutrient or disease issue popping up. When scouting for insects and diseases symptomology, always keep in mind where you've had historical issues with uh, any of these problems. This is where you're likely going to see some of the issues each year. Hot spots often occur on the field edges or where the yard borders areas with many alternate hosts like tree lines and ditch banks. Outside of your hot spots, you also need to walk down a few of the rows within the yard to scout for issues. With insect or disease scouting, we usually recommend walking a W or a V pattern and checking plants along the way. This is ideal because insects and diseases are often clumped up in certain areas and you can miss them easily if you don't check a representative area. Scout your hops at least once a week and try not to go down the same rows each time. It's a good practice to check back on hot spots to make sure your pesticide applications are working properly. But always try to cover new areas each week so significant issues aren't missed throughout the season. Hop scouting usually consists of visual observations uh, such as the leaves and the stems. It's important to look at the plant at three different heights, usually at the bottom of the vines, around the middle uh, eye level, and then towards the top of the vines. Insect problems can occur at all three of these levels, so make sure you closely observe the leaves using a handheld lens. Check the underside and the top of the leaves for aphids, spider mites, and potato leafhoppers. Close observation of a few leaves on each plant should be, well, uh, should be good enough. Over the last two years in Arkansas, we've observed caterpillar pests and mites to be the most serious issues when thinking about insects. We usually see aphids early on after plants begin to climb the wires, but we really just haven't observed damaging levels here or any of the grower collaborator issues or areas. Generally, you get to bad problems when you get about five aphids per leaf. Caterpillars usually begin to show up around the beginning of May and usually don't let up until late into the summer. We're still dealing with them now here in August. Spider mites were a large issue last year because of broad spectrum insecticide use on our caterpillar pests, but this year we swapped to using BT, which protects our natural enemy complex. This has kept mites at bay for the most part, but we are starting to see them get worse now with a favorable hot and dry environment. If you are finding around five mites per leaf, it is going to be time to apply in a miticide. And in general, this is around the time this last year that we started seeing them. Let's now look at some things that we've observed throughout the year in the hops yard and show the importance of scouting different areas of the plant. When thinking about managing insect species or pest species in hops, Scouting is always going to be a critical step in being able to manage with appropriate chemicals without making other pest uh, issues worse. So specifically in hops, what we're really thinking about are spider mites being one of the most serious pests that we get. But a lot of times those are flared by chemicals that we use to control other pests. And so it's good or very important that we get out and try to find these insects quickly so we can use some of the easier chemicals or lighter chemicals like BT to control them at a, a smaller stage. And so whenever you're thinking about scouting for hops, just realize that this is a plant that is, um, here we have them at 12 foot, but realize that you can go have them up to 16 or 20 foot. And so we have really different parts of the canopy that you need to focus on. So you may go look at your hops, you know, get up to about eye level, not see too much going on. Um, and then you may go to where you actually see a lot higher on the plant, like we're seeing over here. You can see that you have 
an issue brewing much higher up. And so right here we have yellow stripe cat or yellow stripe army worms that are feeding about 10 foot up on the plant. And so what this is showing that is that it's very important that you actually look at all three stages. And so when you're scouting for hops, there's a couple different things you want to look at. And so what I first want to show you here is that we have a lot of old damage. And so this is a plant that's very vigorous and growing. And so you'll, you'll, when you go look at it, you'll find a lot of damage that exists. And so this actually right here is feeding that was from earlier infestations of, uh, this right here looks like to be potentially a Japanese beetle. But we have a lot of feeding here that's from old caterpillars and things like that. And so whenever you see some of this feeding, you want to look around, look underneath the leaves themselves, try to make sure that there's not anything around there because just because you're seeing holes in the leaves doesn't mean that there's actually anything there feeding on it at that time. So in this case, it's hard to find anything, but keep looking around and what you'll see is that you can find evidence of a brewing infestation or issue. So right here, what we have is some armyworm eggs. And so it's not exactly easy to tell all the time what armyworm it is. This right here is most likely going to be yellow stripe armyworm. And what this is showing you is that, hey, I have armyworms out here laying eggs. These are potentially going to hatch here in a couple of days, especially because of the color. These are already black in coloration, which means they're just about to hatch. It looks like maybe a few of them already have started to hatch. And this is a prime time to go ahead and spray an insecticide to control them. Um, what I showed you a second ago, let's walk back over here to this other plant. There's army worms that have been hatched for a few days and are already beginning to uh, feed a lot. These are also very easy to control. And you can find evidence of their damage all around. This is some of the older damage that we sprayed for already. Um, but these are going to be a, a, a good time to control them with a softer product like BT, where you're able to get um, effective control without flaring any of them. Mites are probably the biggest pest the more serious pest that we're going to deal with here in hops especially here in arkansas and so when i say mites we're talking about is the two spotted spider mite which is a very widely known pestiferous mite um, if you grow anything from tomatoes to uh, even into some of your blackberries um, but especially a lot of our vegetable crops um, then you know that you've probably dealt with mites in the past so just like with um, the other pests that we're talking about you want to you know think about your whole hops yard you want to be constantly looking throughout the hops yard for things and you want to look at three different levels right um, we've seen hot or mites start up in hops nor more towards the top um, of the canopy and then become an issue even spreading over and then down they can hitch a ride um, on other um, insects moving around so it's important to take a good look you know and i've walked this whole row of hops we have here at clarksville just haven't seen much but if I get down to one end, which is often the case with mites, what you'll see is that you can find a spot kind of where they're popping up. Um, it usually happens around the edge or just in spots that are more dry a lot of times. And so mites actually are gonna come up from the soil or from a lot of the weedy hosts that are around and they can spread them up to the plants. And so what we're seeing here is that we do have what could be a little bit of mite damage. So a lot of times what you're looking for is a little bit of almost burning on the leaves. Um, this can also be a couple of different things, but if you ever wanna make sure that it's mites, turn your leaf over. And so the first thing that you're gonna notice here is that there's a lot of webbing on that leaf. You see all the webbing there? That is a great indicator of mites. And so if I look closely here, I can see little mites running around. So this tells me I have an active mite population here. Um, and so a lot of these leaves with the damage, yep, see, we're getting a lot of the same thing. So you can see the webbing kind of sticking off of that plant or off the leaf on the bottom. And that's going to be a good indicator that there's mites there. If you look closely, you can actually see some predatory species on those mites, which means we've done a good job of maintaining our predator, predator complex out here. But on this one plant, you know, we're actually starting to get a pretty heavy load of mites, which indicates, you know, we need to watch. Because if we were to lose one plant out of this whole row, it's probably not going to be worth spraying a miticide, right? If we lost a lot of the hops here, but these can spread. And so it's important to keep an eye. Once it starts getting bad, 
check the pre-harvest interval on the miticides that you have. So if you have one, you can use a seven day pre-harvest interval. And so you're 14 days away from harvesting. In 14 days of dry weather, you can get a very bad mite issue. So it may be important to go ahead and get one out so that, you know, say you're five days from harvest and now you have just mites so bad that in the next five days, you may lose a lot of yield. You wanna make sure you, you do something with that issue before that time. So it's good to keep an eye on these mites. Right now we have it really just in these couple of plants. But that tells me that we're really close to having a larger issue. And so it may be time to even spot spray some of these mice um, to try to get cold in this, just this one spot. We talked some about beneficial insects. They can help keep your harps or hops yard protected from some other pestiferous species. And earlier I showed some yellow striped army worms and why maybe you wanted to choose something like BT or a softer chemical than spraying something like a you know, a pyrethroid like Mustang Max or Zeta Cypermethan, which would be called. So here actually is a great example of that. And so what we have here is a yellow striped army worm that is actually being killed by a spine soldier bug nip. So you can see the spine soldier bug there. He has actually killed this yellow striped army worm. Um, looks to be at like a third or fourth instar before it's going to do most of its damage. Um, this spine soldier bug, a predator, um, so nymph meaning that it's an immature well, probably would have died if you had sprayed any kind of pesticide that's broad spectrum like a carbaryl which would be seven or a uh, xanotypermethrin which would be mustang max or any kind of bifenthrin or things like that which is a, a good job of killing a pest species but also killing a lot of uh, our beneficials As you can see here there's a lot of damage that's occurred to this plant because it did have a lot of yellow striped army worms on it but these beneficials will act in unison with the BT or some of the uh, lighter products to control. And so even though we've got a good bit of feeding on this plant, um, we actually were able to keep them pretty uh, relatively controlled on most of our plants and keep these populations from moving over into other plants when they got older. I'm going to talk to you today about proper harvesting and handling of hops. Hops plants produce cones used for beer production to impart bitter and unique flavors and aromas. The hops cones produce lupulin, which contain alpha and beta acids used for beer production. The lupulin is the yellow sticky substance in the hops cones. During development, the hops cones feel compressed and moist to the touch, and as the hops cones mature, the cones develop a distinct paper-like crisp consistency with a slight aroma like freshly cut grass or green onions when the hops cones are crushed. Growers can use touch, smell, and sight to determine if hop cones are ripe. Some of the characteristics of ripe hop cones are that the bracts become papery and lighter in color and the edges start to turn brown. The cones themselves become lighter in weight and less moist. Crushed cones have a slight grassy or alfalfa type smell. The lupulin in the cones turn from white yellow to golden and the lupulin glands near full and dimpled become opaque. Dry matter content of the cone is down to 20 to 25%, which is about 80% moisture content. A key factor in hops quality is to dry hops quickly and properly after harvesting. There are several options for drying hops that growers can use. Hops can be dried in an oven set to a low temperature, less than 140 Fahrenheit, but the oven needs to have adequate airflow, like a convection oven. Hops can also be placed on drying screens, such as a house air filter, and placed in warm, dry location, but this can often take days for the hops to dry properly. On a small scale, hops can be dried in a food dehydrator purchased commercially. Growers can build and use a walk-in dehydrator like what we use in this project. We used a walk-in cooler that was converted to a food dehydrator with temperature control, air circulation, and a dehumidifier. Hops drying times can vary. Keys for drying hops include hops cones need a final moisture content of 8 to 10 percent, which is about 90 to 92 percent dry matter. To test the dryness of hops cones, break the central stem of the cone and it should snap in half. The yellow powdery lupulin should easily fall from the cone. The leaves of the hops cone have a papery and springy texture. If hops are not properly dried before storage, the quality can be impacted. 
If you overdry the hops, it could have bad flavor and lose lupulin. But if you underdry the hops, it could become moldy, wilted, or rancid, and the lupulin will not release from the cones. It is important to know how to visibly tell if the hops are dry. If the yellow powdery lupulin falls from the hop cone easily and the texture of the cone is springy, papery, and light, that is a good indication the cone is dry. More scientific ways to check hop cone dryness are available by using a moisture content method. Properly packaging and storing hops after drying is critical for hops quality. It is very important to remove the air from the package before sealing the package. So in general, what we want to do is to place one to two ounces of hops into a food grade plastic bag that is about three to five millimeters in thickness, or they can be placed in an airtight jar. Remove as much air as possible from any container, and vacuum sealing the, I, the bags is ideal. You also want to label the package with the cultivar of the hop, the weight of the hops, and the date harvested, and immediately place the hops in a freezer. When using a vacuum sealer with multiple settings of vacuum strength, which means removing the air from the package, check the amount to remove to seal the hops firmly without crushing hops completely. Most vacuum sealers that can be purchased commercially will not have that option for air removal, but it's important to maybe look for a, a, a brand that does have that option. Hops growers that want to sell hops commercially may need to have their dried hops analyzed by a laboratory for these alpha and beta acids. The results of these analyses will be used by the brewery to confirm the quality and determine the quantity of hops to put in the beer. Commercially hops typically contain 5 to 13 percent alpha acids and 3 to 8 percent beta acids. Only four cultivars, Cascade, Kashmir, Crystal, and Zeus, produce enough cones for quality analysis in the first year of harvest for our project. Total alpha acids range from 3% for crystal and 6% for cashmere, and total beta acids range from 3 to 5% with crystal having the highest. These cultivars had lower alpha and beta acid levels than commercially available hops, but this was only the first year of production, so next year the values should be a little better. The hops grown in Arkansas had good quality attributes for commercial production potential. Increasing the hop production in Arkansas can provide another crop for Arkansas growers and help support the craft brewing industry in the production of beer. We started out, we bought our farm about eight years ago. We knew someday we wanted to have a brewery. We went and uh, got a little one barrel system and built a little, I guess some of the people who, have, who are watching us have seen our tiny little brewery building and uh, we started brewing beer hoping people would come and they did. We brew anywhere from 150 to 200 barrels a year and a barrel is uh, 31 gallons approximately. There's not really one particular style that we specialize in. Of course, when you're on a farm and you have a farmhouse beer or farmhouse style beer that incorporates a lot of the things that you grow on the farm or things that are grown locally, there's a uh, a pretty big local draw for that or even non-local draw you know, there's just anything unique or specific to a place I think interests people and, and that that sells uh, but all of our beers are brewed with 100% craft malt um, and we're actually the only brewery in Arkansas who's certified craft malt brewery which means the American uh, craft malt guild and all craft malt is is uh, a malt house that, that produces the, the grains for us to use in the brewing process, uh, has a one-on-one -on -one relationship with all of their farmers. It's all American grown and uh, it's all traceable back to where it grew. So that's that's quite a bit different from most larger scale breweries or, or breweries who rely on commercial malt, which is sourced from all over the world and, and not necessarily um, as fresh or as, as traceable. Ronnie's a great guy. We've had many, many good conversations out here on the farm, and uh, he's had many a good beer out here made with his hops. Um, I think the best crop that we got from him was maybe his very first one. He he grew these cashmere hops that were um, that were just amazing in in flavor profile and aroma profile and, and everything that you would want in a, a beautiful citrusy hop. There's, there's there's a terroir that goes along with using anything that's grown in a region different than it's typically known for. And so you're, I'm sure all of you are, are discussing and experiencing that, you know, and trying to grow hops in Arkansas. 
uh, 42 degrees latitude is, you know, generally speaking, 42 and above is where everybody's used to hops being grown. And I, I, we see it just as, as anybody would see grapes, you know, a winemaker sees grapes that have terroir from different parts of the world and I don't think hops are any different. Of course, there are certain parameters that are required to make a, you know, a, a mosaic hop taste like it does or make a Chinook hop that bitter, piney, you know, in your face kind of flavor and, and profile. But, um, you know, I, 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 I am completely open to scaling my recipes and adjusting them and modifying them to whatever ingredients I'm working with while maintaining a, a kind of adherence to the style that I'm after. Uh, if you can, if you can grow a hop, and even though you know the name of it and you know what it's supposed to be and, and, and supposed to taste like, you know, there, it's not going to taste or smell the same exact way as a commercial hop is, and that's cool. Um, it makes it uniquely Arkansas, and if you can grow your own hops and brew your own beer, it's a pretty awesome thing to do, and it's a great product to offer people. It's very very rare in the world of craft brewing that, that somebody has their uh, their own estate hopped beer. Thanks everyone for joining us here to tour the University of Arkansas Fruit Research Station Hop Yard. Please go ahead and answer your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen now. We'll be starting our live question and answer session shortly. This research project and webinar was made possible thanks to a grant from the Arkansas Department of Agriculture Specialty Crop Block Program. We are recording this webinar and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. We're going to go ahead and get started with the question and answer session now.